Um, welcome back. My name is James Geary. I'm the deputy curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism, which is just around the corner here, here at Harvard. Um, I was a fellow uh, at the Neiman Foundation a few years ago, and I've been working there um, since shortly after my fellowship. Before that, I lived in Europe for 23 years, um, and I worked for Time magazine for uh, much of that time. I was the editor of the European edition of Time when such a thing actually existed, um, which is uh, an indication of what's been happening to journalism, both in the US uh, and in Europe. Since the title of this um, panel is The Current State of Europe Views from the Newsroom, I have to share with you some breaking news that, that I just received. There will be a reception after this panel, <laughs> and there will be food and drinks. Again. <laughs> Possibly for the last time. So I am going to, um, because I know it's very dangerous to stand between an audience and their reception food and drinks, I'm going to ask my panelists to be uh, concise, and we will end on time at uh, 5, 545. Um, I will introduce the, the panelists in, in the order in which they will speak, and they will make a few opening remarks, and then... Um, I've noticed during the day that there's lots of questions. I have a few questions of my own, but I will come very quickly to you um, to ask your questions. And if you want to get my attention while people are talking, please do, and I will make sure to come to you. Um, one of the themes that has run throughout the whole day is this whole question of optimism and pessimism. And since we're the last session of the day, I'm hoping that we as a panel can transcend that in the spirit of Stanislav Letz, uh, a great Polish uh, writer and dissident, who said, uh, optimists and pessimists differ only on the date of the end of the world. <laughs> so <laughs> on that happy note, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists. And I'm going to start with Eleni Varvizioti. I practice my pronunciation of that. Um, she's a Brussels correspondent for Greece's leading newspaper, Katamarini, and the TV news station Sky. She covered the Greek financial crisis um, extensively, and she does both breaking news and in-depth uh, features. On my immediate right is Stefan Cornelius. He's the foreign editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung. He's hold that, held that position since 2000. <laughs> <laughs> for far too long, apparently. Um, he's also covered uh, very intensively the Christian Democratic Party, the CDU, and he's written a biography of Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor and Her World, which has been translated into 13 languages. Stephen Erlanger on the far right, he's the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. And it would be, I think, more time efficient to list the cities in which he hasn't um, reported than the ones that w in which he has. Um, they include Brussels, Paris, Jerusalem, Moscow, Prague, Washington, Bangkok, and on and on. But I think it's fair to say, having spoken with Stephen earlier, that he feels his greatest, greatest accomplishment is having been an associate editor uh, in the 1970s when he was a teaching fellow here at Harvard on Neiman Reports. Uh, which is a magazine and website that we publish at the Neiman Foundation and still exists and which I edit. So Stephen and I are kind of colleagues. So this is the, your panel for the last session today, and I'd like to start with Eleni. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, when, I first, when my editor first asked me to go to Brussels to, to cover the EU affairs in the beginning of 2014, I was pretty skeptical. I mean, the Eurozone crisis was mostly over. Greece was the last member in our reform program and was almost completing it. The Eurozone was back on its feet. My colleagues were, would ask me, what are you going to do there? It's going to be so boring. It's going to be just technocrat stories and you know stories that nobody's really interested in. Against all advices, I was like, oh, no, OK, I'm going to go. I found myself in Brussels, and little did I know then that the next four years I would be in the forefront of the, covering the most severe EU crisis of all times, which was taking place in multiple fronts. From my own country, Greece being back in the brink of default, another one, UK, leaving the, Eurozo the, the European Union, while the, the Union was hit with the largest migratory uh, flow since World War II. 
So would Europe continue as we know it? No one could tell for sure at that moment. So in January 2015, uh, a radical anti-establishment government was elected in Greece, the first in a populist wave that would fall after that. Syriza, the newly elected uh, party, came to power based on the rhetoric that the EU was bad. The EU partners were harming the country. They were saying that the lenders' demands were so ruthless and rigid that Greece had lost its sovereignty and was following rules and orders from Berlin. They would say that uh, the programs that were prescribed by the EU and the IMF must be resigned. They also said our, that our small Mediterranean country would blackmail its EU partners in such extent, and uh, they would take the whole Eurozone with them to the abyss if they didn't get better terms. People, after five years, being seeing the, their savings of a lifetime disappear while their economy was shrinking about 30% of its GDP, the largest reduction in modern economic history, and they couldn't see the end of the tunnel. They were in the darkness. So out of despair, I think this kind of populist rhetoric was attractive to some and allowed for the first time a leftist government in Greece which advocated the end of austerity. The end of austerity, of course, did not come. In the contrary, it didn't take time for the rapid derailment of the economy, and in a few months' time, Greece was back to square one. <coughs> Empty state coffers, backtracking in major structural reforms, interest rates of government bonds skyrocketing, unemployment figures rising to 25%, youth unemployment to 50%, private sector uh, exports shrinking, while the young and talented leaving the country. Greece seemed to have gone back to its worst days or even further, and European partners were definitely dazzled. All scenarios were back on the table again, including the exit of, of Greece from the Eurozone. It was as if five years of EU and IMF programs were scrapped in few months' time. How could this happen? The, the unraveling at speed of light showed the fragility of the reforms, which, although they were voted, they were never truly implemented. And that was partly because most of Greek politicians would present them as a necessary evil imposed by, by the creditors in order for the country to get the much-needed cash and not because they were truly needed to reform the inefficiencies of the past. It made apparent that Greece never had a discussion on the true reasons of the crisis, such as Ireland and, to a lesser extent, Portugal did. As long as this had not happened, there was no true ownership by any elected Greek government. At the same time, it showed that the EU lenders and the IMF who designed the Greek programs had also failed to address the root causes of the crisis and had been mi micromanaging issues of fiscal reform, which brought great pain and austerity and further delegitimized the reform agenda that was truly needed. And there I was, suddenly covering the biggest story of the world at the time. Being Greek in Brussels put me in the center of things since I was one of the few from the press corps that not only could understand the thinking that would take place in Brussels, but what was happening in Greece. I was trying to explain daily to my, to my viewers and readers the implications that each and every single action had to the economy, to the trust of the EU partners, which was shrinking every day, and how detrimental a, pos a pos possible default and exit from the euro area would be if the completely inexperienced radical Greek government decided to do so. For me, it was a very intense experience. At the same time, my colleagues and I had to fight with the efforts of the government to control the flow of information on the negotiations and present it in a centralized way, the government's view about how things were at the detriment sometimes to objective reporting. It was up to the few of us who were there in Brussels to make sure that all facts were reported to the greatest possible way objectively against any political or executive power agenda. Whenever the, the government did not like my reporting, I would either get publicly uh, criticized by Greek officials or I was attacked by trolls on Twitter. This was not an easy task, and for all of us who had to go through the sleepless nights and the roller coaster of the negotiations, having to deal with this pressure was a transformative experience. But more than anything, I think the events of 2015 gave me a, a, a most comprehensive snapshot of how Europe decides when faced with grave financial and political stress. Before arriving in Brussels, I had covered the first years of, uh, of the crisis from Greece. My impression back then was the decisions were based on the best of the union and most importantly were taken collectively. It proven to be much more complicated than that. While the EU was designed to operate within a strict framework of hierarchy and protocol, throughout 2015, countless rules were broken and procedures ignored. Most of the important decisions were taken by a handful of people in informal settings very late at night, usually the very last minute of an extreme deadline, a process that has become commonplace 
whenever Europe deals with a crisis. In the end of the day, it was human nature manifested through emotions, chemistry, and crucially the clashing personal and political interests of the key protagonists that ultimately determines the fate of millions. Every crisis I have observed since, the modus, modus operandi of their solution has been largely the same. I guess Stephen's going to talk more about Brexit, and I don't want to get into that. Brexit, till this point, has showed that <coughs> it's the only ex exception. We haven't seen it, though, uh, unraveling till its very end. So we, we, we see how the decision-making is going to be taken there. In the case of my country, the compromise between Greece and its creditors was found a few minutes after 7 a.m. on the 13th of July in a small room between the German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, the French President François Hollande, who had already coordinated the response, and secondarily the Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. It was a week before a 7 billion uh, euros debt repayment was due to the ACB, and Greece did not have the money to pay for it. The Greek banks were shut, capital controls were imposed, and Greece's economy, economy was facing collapse. The rest of the 16 heads of state were stuck in a room for the, the past 17 hours, half of them sleeping, half of them chatting, uh, eating and drinking, and waiting patient, patiently to be to told what deal they would have to sign off. No official procedure took place in reality. Three leaders in a room, two of them deciding. For an American following the Greek crisis, many things might not have made sense. A recession, as long as the one that was taking place in Greece, should have been treated with fiscal stimulus, as economic books would suggest. Greek governments should start, start spending after they had first fixed their, their big deficit, and its EU partner should have wiped out large chunks of its debt. But things in the EU don't work this way. Even if it's an economic problem that needs to be solved, politics are the ones who play the number, number one uh, role in the decision making. For the northerners, Dutch, Germans, and Finn, the view of the world is rule-based. Don't forget that the, what the word debt means in German, schuld, uh, which is translated to guilt. To get into debt, you have done something bad, you have not followed the rules, and you were asking Germans to forgive you. That, that would be hard. And on top of that, in each and every decision regarding the Greek program of reforms, political agendas were added. Who can forget that the first rescue program for Greece back in 2010 could not be signed off and was delayed while the country was a step away from default because there were local German elections taking place in Baden-Württemberg and Merkel knew that a bailout would have a ne negative impact to the outcome. Or that the debt relief, which was promised to the previous Greek government under the provision that you have to achieve a primary surplus, was never even discussed due to upcoming EU elections, even though the Greeks had managed to achieve positive numbers back in 2014. Or in the coming year, the instances that tougher decisions were taken due to the Dutch or Finnish elections, like when the true Finns, the extreme right uh, Finnish party, was gaining momentum rallying against another Greek bailout. On the contrary, of course, a recurring theme that usually the Baltic countries would put back on the table is why should we bail out Greece that refuses to cut its pensions, while in our countries, pensions are half as big. Greek bailout was dealt as a political issue in many countries and not as an economic as, as it should have been. And it, it wasn't only politics of member states that played a role in decision making, but also politics of the institutions who were designing the Greek program. For example, when the European Commission, the ECB and the IMF had grave disagreements on policy issues and even clashes amongst them, they were, which were not few, I can tell you, the, often the compromise was the worst denominator for Greece. Because the IMF was adamant that Greece needed a debt relief and the Europeans were, was, would resist, as we mentioned above, uh, but at the same time, Germans needed the IMF to be part of the program due to le legitimacy reasons. The arguments usually ended with a compromise that meant more austerity for Greece to keep everyone happy. Don't get me wrong. Of course, Greece is the one to take the blame. It was its weak administrative system, decades-long corrupted political system, its clientelism, and the, fi and the fiscal derailment that brought the country to the brink of default. Definitely, it was not the decision-making in the, in the European Union, but that also did not help in the solution. The moment the Greek third program was signed off in that summer of 2015 that I described, another huge crisis hit the EU, one that challenged its own, its own identity. Who would have thought that this advanced economic and political union of 500 million will be threatened and fragmented like never before by the sudden arrival of no more than of about one million migrants? The union was completely unprepared to deal with the migra migratory waves reaching Italy, Greece, and to a less, lesser ex, uh, extent Spain, and efforts for collective response and burden sharing were not only unsuccessful, but also brought to the surface deep divisions. Uh, 
again for a second time in a year in order to deal with the extremity of the situation. The major decision that was taken was during a late night meeting in the Dutch embassy between Merkel, the Dutch PM Rutte, and the Turkish PM Ahmed Davutoglu, just before it was presented to the rest of the EU leaders as the so-called EU-Turkish deal. It would give financial support to Turks in order to stem the flows of the migrants who were coming to the Aegean Islands. And the rest of the leaders just signed it off, and people were talking then in Brussels about a brutal procedure. What was also striking in the migration crisis was how the perception towards the Greek government and its Prime Minister Tsipras had changed. The first seven months that the Greek Prime Minister was in power, the EU leaders had many legitimate reasons to see him as a traitor, a man who had to pay a high price for putting in danger once again the Eurozone and the Greek economy at a moment that it had just started to recover, only to please his radical party members, while at the same time asking from his EU partners to foot the bill and indebting the country even more. He was an, ir an irresponsible populist. But when in the summer 2015 the biggest migration crisis hit in Europe, Tsipras became a much needed ally, taking the weight of the migrationary flows. Hotspots and, ide and uh, identification centers were placed on Greek islands, while temporary housing was given to migrants. Compared to countries like Hungary and Poland, who refused to receive a single migrant, Tsipras had become one of the key players in the migration crisis, even though the Greek government was proven to be completely inefficient. It was clear that once he had become useful to the internal politics of others, the European Commission, the Germans, etc., and he had toned down his rhetoric, not only compromise could be found, but also loosening of the implementation of the agreed reforms. In this past August, Greece exited eight years of reform programs. The major goals of all these measures taken were to gain market access, achieve high growth, and reform the biggest inefficiencies of its administration. In reality, at this moment, Greece cannot exit the markets. It has slipped four places in World Economic Forum Competitiveness Index, five places in the World Bank's doing business. Ranking, doing business. Growth is very slim, less than 2%, while the government being populist as it was always, uh, without being under the tight control of the European partners, can now freely say that it won't implement the agreed rebalancing of policy mix from pension handouts to tax exemptions, while there are serious concerns on rule of law with direct interference of the government to judicial procedures. But no one has the appetite to pay attention. Tsipras has managed to pass the reforms through Parliament, EU partners have put a check next to them as completed, and they don't care if they are really implemented or not. The crisis is not flaring, and the Greek P PM also is an important partner on migration. That's all that matters. No one wants to make a fuss. All of the above issues are put under the carpet as the EU has the, the capacity to look away. Especially now that the Union is heading for EU Euro elections, nobody wants to talk about Greece. If Greece gets in trouble again, it will be a new leadership to deal with it. Four years in Brussels, I have definitely become much more cynical about how EU works. But still, yes, I, but still I have to say that I'm an Adam and pro-European. I think that the whole crisis of 2016 uh, showed to, to my country and to my, to my um, fellow Greeks that uh, Greece is so much better in the Euro family than, than being outside. We were flirting with the abyss. We saw the cons we, we were faced um, with the consequences of what it would mean if we left the Eurozone. It's very impressive that still today about 70, 7 out of 10 of, the, of Greeks still believe that they are better off in Europe. Also, as Greeks being at the, the for, Far East border of the Union with Turkey just next to us, it's so important for us to be part of, a, of EU geopolitically. It's of a paramount importance that Greek borders are considered EU borders. Also, one point that we all tend to forget, and I'm always reminding myself, is that if it wasn't for the Union, the above arguments that I said would be, wouldn't be solved in conference rooms, but in battlefields. And for the past 70 years, we haven't had a single bullet being fired. And if one looks at the global map today, EU today is definitely the anchor of stability in uncertain times, especially with this administration in the U.S. It's a continent, continent which combines uh, family values, women rights, protection of the elderly, high environmental standards, best regulated internal market, no death penalty. And there might be bits and pieces in different parts of the world, but altogether and in such extent, they exist back home in the EU. Thank you, uh, 
Thank you, Jameson. Thank you, Alni. I'm, I'm very tempted to continue there where you stopped and yes. talk about Greece in the German perspective, because it's something uh, sort of the other side of the coin. Um, but uh, we, we decided that this is sort of the rag and bone panel and uh, kind of put together what, what's sort of left over from the earlier <laughs> sessions. And this is why I um, offered to talk a bit from about uh, what's really currently and as we sit here and, and and uh, have this conversation currently uh, happening in Berlin and happening to Germany and happening to Angela Merkel, who you, um, who is something in all of our conversations like their uh, point of gravitation, a central point, or, uh, uh, and the nucleus of the European uh, issues and questions, and definitely the German question. Um, I want to briefly outline what basically happened over the past months, um, what will happen now, with a very slight prediction where it will end, probably with whom it m might end. Mm -hmm. And then if there's time left, we uh, probably share some views on sort of the broader impact for Germany and for Europe uh, of that leadership change. And it is definitely um, a, a break. It's a big, big um, uh, seizure for Germany it's a, and for Europe. It's something which, uh, as you all know, who are familiar with our German leadership changes, uh, not a common thing, and the thing in this, circum in this volatile circumstances we live in, uh, a change which is um, honestly also um, um, uh, inflicted with, with quite some risks. So there could be, this, this leadership change is not far from over yet, and it ha could have some, also some serious impact on Europe. Now what happened um, after the coalition, after actually the last elections in uh, September uh, 2017, you followed this uh, hard and and uh, unsatisfying process of finding a government coalition government in uh, in Germany, two rounds, two attempts, one failed uh, coalition, uh, uh, brand, being branded the Jamaica coalition at that time. Uh, so actually, um, some experience Merkel uh, this summer only in one of those summer interviews framed as sort of a staatspolitischer Fehler the FDP sort of a uh, a mistake of uh, a gravitational mistake, uh, basically um, uh, risking uh, state stability by not joining the coalition. Nevertheless, that situation forced the Social Democrats to come back into the, what is called Grand Coalition, which is not grand at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this coalition uh, was the only way out of uh, the, the, the quagmire of not being able to form a stable government uh, and uh, avoiding new elections at the same time. And if there was one um, sort of joint uh, assumption in the party landscape, it was that one definitely should not vote again, because that would only help <clears throat> the radical forces and uh, mostly the AFD. Now, that coalition finally came to, um, uh, to existence, and the government was sworn in. That was Eastern that, this year. Uh, so that was March, as much as I remember. Uh, but immediately continued with the bickering and the quarreling which we saw over the previous times before. At the center of, um, of problems was uh, the CSU and its chairman, Horst Seehofer. Now, the driving forces leading Horst Seehofer and the CSU into being the, 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 the irrational uh, partner in that coalition were, were extremely simple. It was a power game. It was a game of power between Seehofer and uh, Markus Söder, who is now the Bavarian prime minister. But at the time, the problem started, and actually the time even previously before the elections, cooking up the uh, migrational issue again, uh, bringing it up in various forms and bits and pieces during the past months. Um, it was a, a, a sort of a, a token by the leadership circle, circle of the CSU to basically uh, externalize their internal fights they had about who should lead the party and what role should um, uh, Seehofer have in the future. Uh, the sort of the mark which were, everyone was aiming at was uh, the uh, October uh, 14th when the Bavarian election uh, were to be held. So um, the time from beginning this coalition in Berlin in March until October was pretty much marked by that uncertainties and by this internal CSU uh, fights, uh, by the attempt of Horst Seehofer to extend his um, uh, lifespan, his political lifespan, and to guarantee his survival. And on the other side, by uh, Markus Söder, uh, 
to bring back some kind of calm and stability to Bavaria because he knew that um, uh, the polls and the political mood in Bavaria was as bad as it in the end proved to be. And um, he had to basically um, not allow Seehofer to get out of the bind. He needed someone he could blame for after the election. So this entire political charade we saw over the past month was for my opinion, very much centered about the question on who should be the CSU leader and who should be the strong man there and who could be blamed in the end. Angela Merkel, on the other side, was not strong enough to prevent it from being, from happening. So the huge flare-up we saw in June where the coalition almost broke and the partnership between CDU and CSU was about to, uh, to be uh, dissolved. And the ongoing fight in September about the fate of their um, intelligence um, uh, uh, director uh, Marson uh, from the Internal Intelligence Service um, was that was uh, basically proving that Angela Merkel didn't have the strength to rein in her government to um, to call for order and to impose um, her will uh, on an extremely weak coalition where all partners were not unhappy with each other. With that um, scenario laid out. The test and the benchmark was definitely this fall, both elections in Bavaria and Hessen. And already this summer, um, their extremely disgruntled CDU base, or let's say the middle, uh, the middle man, sort of the, the second and third row, were debating scenarios on how to get rid of Angela Merkel. Because they knew with that woman, and since it was extremely personalized, uh, after 12 years in government or 13 and 18 years in power with the CDU, it was clear um, that she could not could not get rid of that um, sort of the, this broad view, which was established at that point, especially on the German right and on the extreme right, that this that she is personally responsible for whatever evil is there in this country. Um, Angela Merkel, for the first time since I remember, was um, chosen as sort of a, a sole scapegoat, especially from the extreme right, from the AFD, to such an extent we only, uh, sort of, uh, so in, in a loaded way, we only s basically see her in this country. Personalized, um, uh, hate-filled, um, extremely uh, uh, dangerous for the CDU. Uh, the party base, um, nevertheless, didn't have the guts and the powers to get rid of her, and it needed additional help. And that help came with the elections, which expectedly didn't turn out that good. Uh, in both elections, the first, the CSU in Bavaria lost 10 percent, and in Hessen, the CDU lost 11 percent. And it was pretty much clear that after such a loss, there have to be consequences. Now, Angela Merkel always said she would uh, try to self-determine when she leaves, and she wants to steer that process herself and doesn't want to be uh, driven uh, from outside forces. So she knew and she sensed that this kind of opposition was brewing and that the test would have been coming this weekend, actually yesterday, last uh, this past Sunday and today, where the, German, uh, where the CDU Leadership Council was meeting uh, for a retreat to prepare for the party conference in December 6 or 7. And that party conference is a decisive one because it is uh, an, uh, an, an electoral conference. It's a conference where they vote for the party chairman and other leadership positions. The next leadership vote will be in two years' time. So if you want to get rid of someone on a regular basis, you have to either act now or wait for two years, for in two years' time. Angela Merkel sensed that her political lifespan had been outstretched and that she had to act. And since she got word from uh, people like uh, Laschet in North Rhine Westphalia, who was a kind of a middleman between those rebellious forces and on the other side, loyal to the chancellor herself, being her deputy in the party and being in office himself, uh, he was probably the one who, um, who, who brought the message to her that, um, well, this is brewing and that there are uh, changes expected. And I guess she took the Hessen election, or the day after the Hessen election, as uh, some kind of a last exit. This was probably the last moment where she could self-determined decide how her fate would end. And this is why she gave that rather remarkable speech at the party leadership level and then afterwards for the public. And it's really worth looking for because, uh, or, or reading, uh, reading it again, because it really proved that she was um, um, 
extremely clear on what she thought and how she um, was aware of her position and about the state of Germany. And she gave it in such a gracious and sort of um, um, uh, state womanship like way that one could actually say, yes, uh, she knows about the stakes, which there are, and she wants to steer it in a, in a, in a proper way. This is remarkable because this is the first time, um, as I remember, that a leadership position of that kind has been handed over in a more or less vol uh, volatile or an, and an orderly fashion. Usually this is, this is ending in tears and rubble. And this time mm -hmm. it probably can work in, in a much more disciplined or sort of orderly fashion. Now, um, she... Um, What will happen now, um, quickly on that, um, we do now have uh, reportedly 12 candidates running up for this party conference and wanting to become chairman of the CDU or chairwoman of the CDU. Six of them are known. It's actually weird that uh, there are rumors out that we, there are more candidates than we know. Uh, nevertheless, in the end, and you know the three of them who are who ran the biggest chance to, um, to succeed her, one is her party general secretary, Annegret kamm karrenbauer the other one is Friedrich Merz, who is well known also to this audience, um, and who is now in business. And the third one is Jens Spahn, junior minister, 38 year of age, uh, for uh, health and, um, uh, uh, yes, public health. And he's um, um, sort of from the more conservative uh, bench. Um, the party conference will vote on it. There will be a leadership run-up. They will do have sort of um, party, um, a party roadshow ahead of the, uh, the December conference. But in the end, these 1,100 delegates of the party conference will vote. So there won't be a, a, both, a vote from the party base, but from those delegates. This is interesting and important to know because those delegates usually are steered. So basically, you, um, you organize yourself in the regional fashion. All the Landesverbände, all those regional um, CDU entities um, come up with their favorites, which they back, and this plays basically um, in the hands to both men and mostly to Friedrich Merz, who has the strongest base because he's from North Rhine-Westphalia, and they have almost 300 delegates of the 1100, which is quite a stock already. And then he is pretty sure that he has the other strong uh, camp behind him, which is uh, Baden-Württemberg, where um, actually the, rebe the rebellion grew strongest against Merkel. Um, just mention the name Wolfgang Schäuble. So there are a couple of old, um, some old, old, old fights being brought back. Uh, just as a footnote, I mean, this kind of battle, which is now <coughs> unfolding, um, is f framed in a very limited way to sort of the revival of the of so the old the old arch enemy uh, contest we see. Mertz versus Merkel versus Schäuble. You remember the late 90s and the early 2000s when Merkel took over the party with a scoop against Helmut Kohl and uh, where she pushed away the sort of the young um, West German CDU elite uh, coming in from the East, the East German woman, Protestant woman by all means, and sort of got rid of the old CDU system Helmut Kohl built and, and thought. And now the theory is, well, the old boys are coming back and, and reclaiming their territory. I actually would refrain from limiting to this. There might be some truth to it. But on the other side, I mean, 18 years have passed since then. And both the CDU and Germany have turned into some different animals. And so I wouldn't limit it down to that. There might be some male ego thing behind it. But then again, um, the CDU is also a female party, and this is what probably plays to the advantage of Annegret kamm Um Just want to say a few verdicts on the candidates. Uh, probably the two key ones we, sh we have to watch. One is Annegret kamm karrenbauer and the other one is Friedrich Merz. And Friedrich Merz definitely is, even though the young CDU types are rallying behind him, is not the young type of uh, uh, party chairman. He's now 63. He's basically a contemporary of Angela Merkel. He's the old Western CDU. He's limited extremely to his economic and, and, and business um, portfolio. Uh, he lacks credentials on 
sort of his green side, on the, on, on the, on the women vote, on the female vote, on um, so many uh, sort of softer issues, social issues, uh, so many other things on Europe, um, well, where he's sort of trying to start now uh, to build his, um, his reputation again. He's a known transatlanticist. He's a, probably a staunch negotiator. He's a good narrator. Uh, he's sort of a leadership type. And um, on the other side, Annegret Kam karrenbauer um, is pretty much sort of a little Merkel type. Nevertheless, she uh, is not known enough, and she's definitely as bad as a narrator as, she, as, as Merkel herself is. So you don't have the ideal candidate here. And quite honestly, to give a prediction now who will win this race is extremely difficult to say, because uh, those four weeks will be extremely volatile. It's, it might be changing a lot, and it might hint on some issue boiling up, let's say, about the BlackRock engagement of British Mads, who is uh, chairman of the board uh, of BlackRock Germany, and which is something uh, Germans might be a little bit more um, uh, hesitant to love than the Americans would do. But nevertheless, so there, it's an open contest. Um, what's happening to the government after there's a change in leadership? Um, big question, actually the key question, will she be able to govern until the very final end, which is in three years' time, or almost three years' time, or not? Well, there are two things. There is a political dynamic and there's the constitution. The political dynamic would say, well, if there's a new leader in the party, he's hungry for power, he wants to get in the job, she'd better step aside, otherwise she's being steamrolled over. Um, but then there's the Constitution, and the Constitution, for some good reasons, which do have are rooted in German history, makes it extremely difficult to get rid of a chancellor. Um, to get rid of a chancellor, either she has to step aside, which would then lead to the new powerhouses trying to form a new government, and if that doesn't work, it would lead to re-elections, or she would have to face a vote of non-confidence, which basically means that her own party would vote against her. Now, whose interest is it to have elections and whose interest is it to have a new government at that point? It's an interesting pattern if you watch it closely. The CDU might want to have a new government and they want to reinstall, uh, want to install, let's say, Friedrich Merz, for example. Um, but the Social Democrats, and Sigmar Gabriel is not here anymore, but I could would bet sort of his, his ticket back home, that, that, he's, uh, that the SPD is not inclined to vote for him, so they would leave the coalition. Uh, there's a strong Im impetus within the SPD to leave the coalition anyway. Um, so the CDU would be forced to try to f negotiate a, a Jamaica coalition with the Liberals and the Greens again, but the Greens wouldn't be interested in joining such a coalition either, because they are now ended up a year ago at, I think, 8 or 9 percent touch points in the, uh, in the last elections, and they uh, poll now at about twice that number, so 18 to 20 percent. So there's actually no incentive for them to just join a government without having a vote. Uh, the SPD doesn't want to have a vote because that could marginalize them. So there are a lot of competing interests, and the question on how to get rid of her will be actually extremely interesting. And we could find ourselves in a situation where she continues to govern, and where Friedrich Metz bites his uh, teeth or whatever and uh, uh, wanting to get in and not, not um, uh, managing to. Just two, three final thoughts on the broader impact. What does it mean for Germany? What does it mean for Europe? Well, first of all, it's a real seizure. It's a real break for Germany, and I said that earlier. It's not happening that often. Um, it's the first time that the, uh, in, in post-war history, apart from the, 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 the change from Adenauer to Erhard, that a party... Um, has to change the chancellor basically in midstream. The likeliness is that the CDU will continue to govern is extremely high because they're remaining the strongest party in the system. So they have to change the chancellor uh, without harming themselves and without running and uh, endangering them of losing uh, their majority. Now, Angela Merkel has made something quite remarkable. She provided this opportunity for the party to succeed in that because her offer now to hand over on an orderly basis is something the Germans basically admire and think it, it is good for the country. So this is a, 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 a notion of stability and, and sort of a hint for uh, predictability. Nevertheless, all this happens whilst, and we debated that all day long, the European political landscape is changing. Um, populist and extremist forces are, 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 um, are circling in. Uh, we do have huge uh, instabilities coming up in Europe, Italy now with the budget debate, with the European elections in, in May, um, with other um, 
problems uh, coming in. So there is no uh, guarantee that this change, this kind of um, taking away the main weight sort of in the German political system, the chancellor herself, uh, that this will not lead into a major uh, destabilization of the German party system itself. It could happen. It could happen when panic uh, breaks out. Let's say when the CDU has not a clear leadership uh, vote, when the as Social Democrats of the European elections in May finally leave the coalition because they're worn out and they want to get out because they think this is the only way they survive. And sort of we get a moment of uncertainty and a political vacuum. That could happen. But on the other side, this change gives room for, for to breathe. And you already saw it in the days after Merkel's announcement how the CDU actually rejoiced in the idea of having a choice of different leader types, of diving into a political argument, what they want to be for, what, they, what the party will be focused about. So it is reinvigorating the political party system, and this is a good thing. This is a good message. And the other message is that the AfD is shivering on the right, because all those figures, probably apart from Kram Karrenbauer, are that conservative that they will eat away a lot of their votes, and they will, would shrink definitely in, a, in the next vote. To the European level, well, um, we got used to Angela Merkel being the balancer in Europe, being the central force. And quite honestly, all the reactions on her uh, soon demise were rather uh, sort of sorrowful or pitiful. Or people were afraid of that moment. Um, so yes, there is, um, this is a major uh, challenge for the European balance, also for Germany's role within the EU. Because under, under Angela Merkel, after the um, after the Lehman crisis and the Euro crisis, and then uh, certainly with the refugee crisis, Germany became definitely the, 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 the balancing power in Europe, much more as it ever had been. France's weakness, especially under President Hollande, but also with Macron, who is not really um, um, building up the, the, the power he needs to project his interests mostly into Central Europe. Um, um, uh, is even though with, with Merkel on her way out, France is not really taking over that leadership role. And so the question is, will a successor of Angela Merkel at one point be able to continue that without any interruptions or without any, any serious bump on the road? Um, I doubt it. Uh, so prepare for uh, some uncertainties here. Um, but also prepare for an opportunity, let's say for European change. Angela Merkel was bound with so much, she had had so much baggage to carry on after 12 years in her office that she wasn't able to move on the big reform ideas Macron had and so on and so forth. So there might be an opportunity for a successor to open the windows a bit and let in some, some, some fresh air. So let's leave it here. I think there would be so much more to say, but... Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. First, thanks to Eleni and Stefan for these deep dives into Greece and into Germany. And James, thank you too. We miss your Time magazine very, very much. Um, given the vote tomorrow, I've already voted, by the way, um, I decided I would wear my enemy of, enemy of the people pin. Um, just to be in the mood, sent to me by a sort of fan, or maybe not a fan. Um, <laughs> but I'm proud of it. I also wanted to thank you all for sticking with us. It's a long day, and you've been great. So I appreciate it. I, I keep thinking Christine Lagarde likes to say sometimes at the beginning of her contributions, particularly at the end of a long day, and this is the end of a very long day, that she feels like the last wife of Henry VIII, <laughs> that she knows what's expected of her, but isn't sure how to make it interesting. <laughs> so that's a, a little bit how I feel. Um, I'm going to try to go a bit broader. <laughs> She's still alive. Um, <laughs> Who knows? Maybe she'll be in Brussels. No, no, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, well, exactly. Um, Europe is, I think, under deep 
deep strain and it's sleepwalking. And this is a real problem. Um, we have a counter reaction in the form of a kind of anti elitist populism, which is very different in different places. It's very hard to call it by one name, but let's call it for the sake of simplicity populism. Um, it starts probably with the global economic crisis, um, with the stagnation of middle class incomes, with the death of middle class dreams, um, but also with the deep technocratic arrogance of a European system which has all the trimmings of a state but isn't a state, which has all the pomposity of a bureaucracy but has no demos, that feels no real responsibility to anyone except itself. Um, certainly not to the press, by the way. It's a very difficult place to work, I should say. Um, so I you know, have spent a year in Brussels after the last four years in Britain. So in Britain, which is probably the way to begin, um, I had two elections and two referendums. Um, I got the Scottish referendum exactly right. The Brexit referendum, I wouldn't say I called, but I knew it was really up in the air. So the night of the vote, the day of the vote, I wrote four different pieces. Two to run if it won, and two to, to run if it lost, because really the polls were too close and I didn't know. And I traveled enough around Britain to know that it had a very good chance of winning. And also I watched probably the worst campaign ever run by David Cameron, who kept thinking it would all be all right on the night. And his general argument was, Brussels is shit, but we're better off in it than out of it. Now that was about as positive as it ever got. <laughs> right? Not very attractive. And this whole brilliant idea of take back control, which is completely gorgeous. It's something Nick Burns might have come up with. You know, it's so perfect as a way of convincing people. Take control of what? No one was very sure take control of their children, of their wives, of their husbands, of their government, possibly, of their borders, certainly. Um, and this really is, I think, the important thing. We've talked all day, to some degree, about identity, about migration, um, about the shock of um, cultural change. These things are true, and they're real. And they're not going away. Um, and it is also true, let's say, if you look at support for other populist earlier ones, like Geert Wilders and people like that, they get the most support in places where there are very few migrants or immigrants because this is the place that's afraid of having them come. And in Britain, again, places that had a lot of immigrants, in general, big cities were very pro-Remain, and countryside, England mostly, was very um, Brexity. And if you went to places like the other Boston, the Boston in um, Lancashire, Lincolnshire, thank you, <laughs> um, you had quite an extraordinary experience because Tony Blair and all his decency was just convinced that you know, Britain needed workers and it was all very nice. And Britain, of course, was pushing the accession of Central Europeans both into NATO and into the EU. Um, and so he did not have the restrictions on immigration for new countries that almost every other country in the European Union had. So naturally, Poles poured in to Britain. And Poles work very hard, and they're very good at lots of things. 
and <clears throat> they were used, manipulated, abused by British farmers, by British manufacturers. They made the sandwiches you buy at Wait Rose. They picked the strawberries. They did all that stuff. And in places like Boston, so many Poles came, mostly Poles, that whole neighborhoods grew up that were Polish speaking, that had Polish shops, that sold Polish food, that sold Polish beer, which for some Britons was probably a good idea, but <laughs> many didn't like it. But you did really have the sense of, of a cultural clash. And it created tremendous stress on school places because school places were estimated without thinking about all the immigration, right? I mean, they, they looked at British demographics, so there, there weren't enough classrooms, there weren't enough teachers. Big strains on, on the National Health Service and a kind of cultural shock. Um, and, and this really resonated, I think, um, and it resonated throughout um, Britain. You also had a very big age difference, I mean, generational difference in terms of Remain and um, Brexit. But what's done is done. Um, March 29th is coming pretty soon. Britain's leaving. I think there'll be a deal. Um, they're struggling over the hardest part of the deal, which, of course, Britain never really thought through, which was the Ulster problem. The Irish problem rears its ugly little head. Um, sometimes you kind of wish the Irish Revolution had just pushed its way all the way into Ulster, but that, that was not going to happen. And you find Theresa May, who, you know, who is hardly an, anyone's idea of a natural politician. Um, it's very, she works like a donkey, but she's very awkward with people, very awkward on television. Um, you know, people admire her, her decency and her sense of duty, um, but she was known as um, Robo May all through this campaign. And it was terrible. And she lost a majority. It was quite extraordinary. And now is dependent on the DUP, which is the hardest line left in Ulster. Um, and um, I think I've tried to say this to Michel Barnier, who's the negotiator, that he really must not underestimate the constitutional problem of Northern Ireland that the DUP will not wear anything that makes it seem like they are differentiated from the rest of the United Kingdom. That's why they exist. They're called the Unionist Party for a reason. Um, and so we have this problem. I think we'll work it out. There are people are talking about the bridge to the backstop, to, right? Um, but we'll see. Um, I think Brexiters in particular um, who are in some ways out of control, I mean, she's not in control of her own government at, at all, um, will not do anything to get in the way of March 29th happening. Their general view is let's get out, we'll be legally out, then we can kill her on April 1st, right? You know? And then someone else will negotiate probably the future relationship. But they're terrified of a new elections because they've been in power a really long time. People are sick of them. Um, Jeremy Corbyn is a very unlikely kind of prime minister, but change happens, turnover happens, and the center in Britain seems to have imploded as it's imploded everywhere else. But what fascinated me really is though Trump insists that he predicted Brexit would win, this is one other thing about which he's become confused between truth and his own stories. He actually arrived in, in Scotland the day after Brexit and then took credit for it, but now says that he um, predicted it. But I mean, Trump learned a, a lot of lessons, and he learned a lot of lessons from Aaron Banks, who is now under investigation for um, how he funded this extra leave campaign. Was it Russian money? Was it his own money? Who knows? 
Um, but Aaron Banks is basically, their, their line was, you scare people, you never apologize, you keep to the line. And this has been Trump's line all, all the way through. Um, and the thing that pulls them together, which fascinates me, is the Brexiters did not expect to win. Boris Johnson just wanted a good showing so he could become prime minister and show to the Tory party that he was really with them in their soul. Um, Trump certainly didn't expect to win. I mean, that we know. And it's one reason why he had nobody lined up to do anything in Washington. Um, it was never intended to, to be. But now having won, of course, both sides have convinced themselves that it was always going to happen. And what uh, unites them is the joint terror, on both on the Trump people and the Brexiters, that somehow the elite will take away their victory, will water it down, um, and which is, helps explain how, why they're so defensive, why they're so angry, why they're so partisan. Um, and, you know, in, to respond to these issues of passion, Brussels is not built for this kind of thing, right? So um, we then, of course, see the implications of this sense, I think, in, among voters that, you know, we can throw off what's expected of us. I, I think that's a momentum that carried through, carried through in the Austrian vote, it carried through in the Italian vote. I mean, even in the French vote, don't forget, I mean, the French vote was a vote against tradition. It was against what there was. I mean, Macron came up the middle out of nowhere because the two main parties collapsed, right? Um, so to see Macron as somehow the defender of European traditions, I think, is a real misreading of what he is. I mean, he wants to be a revolutionary. Um, and, you know, my fear is, of course, he thinks of himself as Jupiter, that he's really Icarus, <laughs> but we'll have to see. Um, but so there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot of flow. Um, my own guess is that the populist wave has pretty much peaked, by the way. We'll see. Peaked with S Salvini. Um, but, you know, I hesitate to say that, but I think it's true. I mean, in general, um, in most countries, I just covered the Swedish elections. People were terribly afraid of the Sweden Democrats. They tend to poll much better than they actually get in, in the votes because in the polling booth, you know, in the booth, sometimes people have a kind of prise de conscience and they think, well, I don't know. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. But still, 13 to 15% in traditional Western democracies is a lot. And even if you think of France or Germany, if you combine the far left and the far right, you know, both populisms, you get upwards to 30%. But what you don't get is a majority. Um, and um, that, I think, is, to me, very encouraging. Um, I think the other main strain, which is a different kind of populism. We've talked all day a little bit. Well, we've talked all day really about Poland and Hungary. Um, I think this is something Brussels never expected. I mean, they kind of understand the political science to some degree of populism, of politics. But this question of identity, this sense of... Um, the post-communist world not being willing to go along with Western assumptions, the sense of resentment, ressentiment, of, of peoples who had been held down first by communism and now feel a little bit held down by Brussels, um, who are ethnically much purer than the rest of Western Europe. I mean, if you think of these societies, they're about 2%, not 20% mixed. That makes a tremendous difference. And I think people just haven't understood it properly. I mean, so 
we've heard earlier today very good explanations of, of this feeling of, of cultural identity, national identity, historical identity. Um, but I think we've underestimated the unwillingness of peoples who've lived under outside influence, who've just regained their sense of sovereignty, to give much of it back again and to give it back to, you know, to a Brussels that for many people much more religious in the East than in the West, see as the capital of a kind of neoliberal, technocratic, gender-bending um, society that has lost its Christian roots, that's lost its sense of self. Um, and of course, we see that inside the societies also. I mean, what is, you know, what was Brexit about? It was about something we hadn't really heard of in a long time, which was English nationalism. English nationalism, right? What is AFD about? It's an alternative for Germany. Uh, what is the National Front about now? It's called something else, but it's national, national, national. And this, I'm afraid, is not going to go away. So I think I'll end it here. Um, but simply to say, you know, as someone in Brussels trying to write about these themes for Americans, it's not so easy. Uh, I do my best um, to explain the intricacies and not get stuck too far in, into the details. But I think what's happening in Europe is a really important laboratory um, for a new kind of politics, a new kind of in integration or disintegration. And, and we need to pay a lot of attention to it. So I look forward to questions. Um, and thank you for your patience. So we just have a few minutes for questions. Um, OK, and we have some. So I see this. Uh, just, just a quick question for Stephen Erlanger. Uh, I, I'm confused, because at the end, you said you thought populism had peaked with Salvini, which was one message. But then you ended by saying, but nationalism is here to stay. Uh, so uh, do you see a, a contradiction between populism and nationalism? I mean, it seems to me that the kind of populism that we're witnessing in places like, uh, like uh, Hungary uh, uh, is nationalistic. Uh, so, so do you really think it has peaked? I mean, that's a very optimistic view, and I, I, I hope you're right, but, but I don't know how that squares with your notion that nationalism is here to stay. And can I just say, if you want to take more questions about the word? No, I think we can go one by one, but I think if the questions can be concise and the answers as well. OK. Well, just to say, I don't think they're the same thing. By the way, you can be a nationalist without being a populist. You can be a patriot and and vote for the left or the, you know. So that's what I. That's a distinction I didn't make very well, but that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. You. That was terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, quick question. Um, I was interested. You're saying Trump really didn't expect to win. That's the Michael Wolf Fire and Fury book, which I found utterly gripping. Because of that scenario. Um, and quite a lot of it may be true. That's what I was wondering, <laughs> if, you, if you were corroborating his account. And then for Stefan, thank you for spelling out all the, 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 the complexities involved in actually replacing Angela Merkel as chancellor. I was wondering which you actually saw as the most likely outcome. Uh, the most likely outcome will be that Friedrich Merz is elected party chairman, and that the handover will be um, not happening immediately, but rather sooner than later. Yes, and I guess we'll have elections then. Sorry. Yes, sir. Thanks for these contributions. Uh, getting rid of uh, points, getting re rid of uh, Angela Merkel seems a little like getting rid of Theresa May. Uh, it's not, a lot of people want to do that, and it's not clear what comes next. But my question is, <coughs> is it similar to uh, Susan Suleiman's? Uh, the populist vote as such, these far-right parties may or may not have crested, but, but it seems to me that it's gone a long way in poisoning the well 
uh, of the rest of the political spectrum, uh, or a lot of the political spectrum, not only in the substantive attitudes taken, but in the degradation of language, in the rhetoric, in the stigmatization, like in your button. And that, I fear, is going to be with us quite a while. So. And Lenny, do you want to address that? Because you've received some abuse. Some yeah, I mean, it's not an American. I think it's populist governments, as the one that's in my country, they use such tactics of, of fear. I mean, in the, the beginning when the, the Greek government was in power and they were trying to sell that we were going to get better uh, better negotiation with the, our European partners if we blackmail them in a way. And uh, this was not happening, of course. The first seven months till they got a deal was a disaster. Whoever would report, and I would do that from Brussels because I had the European point of view saying, you guys, this doesn't work. Your finance minister of Arfakis is a mess. It's a disaster what you're going. And uh, when I would report such, stu such stuff, I would get either uh, publicly shamed by the spokesman saying that I'm un un unreliable, that don't listen to her, and then an attack from trolls on Twitter. I mean, they had organized uh, accounts on Twitter. And then when s uh, I would write something, then you would have hundreds of responses, like with very harsh words um, naming you. And uh, that was organized to just to create fear and stop doing what we had to do. Just say the state of things. Just one thought very quickly, sir. Not, but yeah, since yeah. you, you are mentioned um, earlier, there, uh, Germany being um, sort of in, in this populist game being a, 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 a well-used um, target, uh, this is my fear, actually, from the leadership change we're seeing now in Germany, that uh, you might provoke uh, or you might see it much easier to um, uh, roll out the old guns, uh, uh, anti-German sentiment, and vice versa, bringing up sentiments in Germany. So this kind of populism we see uh, in the inter, international populism in Europe uh, wasn't really working well with Merkel, even though she was branded uh, sort of the, the witch of Europe at, from, in, in some parts, some uh, Greece or Spain, wherever. Uh, but um, I, my fear is that we will see a much higher temptation to use the old cliches and to come up with um, in that sort of nation. And also, I, I agree with you. Basically, this stuff moves everyone to the right. That's the problem. That's the impact of it. But it also means as you move others to the right, you probably lessen the impact of the vote for the populace themselves. But we'll see what happens. Sorry. Right, not to the right, because right, it's fine. Um, to you, uh, Stefan, uh, will Angela Merkel, uh, could you speak up, please? Come up here. Will Angela Merkel uh, have the same authority she used to? The question is, will Angela Merkel have the same authority? Will as she have yeah, the same No, she will not, because uh, uh, they're the leader. Yeah, the announcement is a is a prank, and, uh, and, and sort of, but she realized that. Yes, she did, but what she I mean, she will have more authority uh, uh, now than she would have had if she would have been pushed out uh, of her office. So um, Angela Merkel always thinks in these sort of alternative patterns, and she's not somewhere with her heart. She goes the, the, the way which is sort of the most optimal for her, and at that point of her political life. Uh, the, the best choice she could have made was to step aside voluntarily and hoping that she could preserve at least a bit of her treasury authority. She was in Ukraine a few days ago, and everywhere where she goes now, you have this report of sort of dead woman walking, and she's almost gone, and, and like, like calling the obituaries all over the place. And she was um, sort of, um, uh, she, she, she was tempted to uh, give this little hint that, um, she said, I'm not, I can't quote her verbally now, but something like, um, in the end, I still am the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. <laughs> Meaning, this is quite something. Don't underestimate it. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, uh, thanks very much. I still have one. Sorry. Uh, you know that Manfred Weber runs for uh, Spitz and Candidate? Sorry? You know that Manfred Weber runs for uh, yeah. Spitz and Candidate from CSA? Yeah. Do you think he has chances? 
Yes, he has a good chance because the EPP is behind him, and, and there are other than with Stubb, uh, Stubb would be a better candidate. Uh, but but he's Merkel supported him. Yes, supported him, but reluctantly, and uh, he's definitely not. He's not a not a big star. So we're rapidly running out of time. So I have a question short. here, and then here, and then but here. So a one of the last oh. questions on a positive note for the EU, but perversely and counterintuitively. The EU is probably better off with its many different nationalisms than the US. Because in the EU it's fragmented and because you have very different nationalist populist parties with different degrees of authoritarianism versus democracy, etc. Whereas the US, where you'd never have thought this was possible given the institutions, given how, ha how hard it, it has been for populists to actually get elected, once you've got one elected, he's you know he's got the bully pulpit. He uh, can hollow the st the deep state out from within, etc. So just a thought for you, right? Happy. <laughs> On a more pessimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Two hats. Three are coming. Of three, really, of three problems. Uh, the, the Euro crisis in Italy is coming up. It's serious, much more serious than the Greek one. <laughs> we have the uncertainty in Germany, which is the country which will, <coughs> must play the key role, and it must overcome its reluctance to help, this time really in a, in a much more substantial way. At the same time, we have a change in the presidents of the European Central Bank. So the, the old constellation that Angela Merkel uh, would quietly support the head of the ECB in, in helping and doing the right thing, that's gone. Uh, so, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> um, just... I'm a little less worried about Italy. Maybe than I should be, partly because their debt is so high, they can't push it too far. 1% rise in interest rates takes their primary surplus and blows it right out the window. So I think Italy is, wants to be in the EU. It, wants, it sees itself as European. It's tired of being um, shat upon by everybody else, which ignored their big migrant problem. But I, I really pres I expect this budget thing to get resolved. Well, partly by the markets, yeah, but also because Italy doesn't, if, if Italy screws up, it screws up Salvini too. So I don't think he wants to push it that far, but I'd like to get some other votes. Wir sehen. You, have to contrast. <laughs> you, can, you can do it over wine. <laughs> Now, I'd like to link the previous panel and this one on the issue of how do we tackle migration in Europe. And John, you know, advocated yes. his solution. Now, my question to this panel is, we see in the U.S. in particular over the past days and weeks how Trump lied on migration. And it seems to me from a European perspective, U.S. media weren't able to correct those lies in an impactful way so it would actually get through to people. Are we... Going down that same lane in Europe, do you see trends in the way the European public sphere works that we risk the same situation? That, you know, what you said about populists, how they build this threat image, which I totally shared in terms of your analysis. Are we able to communicate policy solutions against the backdrop of this, you know, fear and lie uh, scenery that is being drawn? I think in, in, uh, in some countries, yes, and some no. And the bad news is you can never trump populism. I mean, you can never beat populism with a rational argument because it's too blunt. And uh, it's too, uh, to, uh, the argument is, uh, by nature, much more differentiated, much more complex than uh, the populist message. So this is why you basically lose. And my fear, and this is probably just a quick uh, remark to your earlier remark on, on sort of the splinteredness of the European populist movement, I wouldn't be that, um, that um, um, I would be rather more pessimistic about it because they have a unifying issue, and that's the EU. Uh, so if the, if the populists unify over their anti-EU stance and the anti-euro uh, stance, this is the big storm coming. This is the perfect storm coming. And it'll come uh, right in time for the European elections in May. And this is where Karl's 
problem with Italy will actually have its boiling time. And if you look at the markets, they're all gearing towards that. So I, I fear uh, that we really have to fasten seatbelts for next spring and have to get a very simple message out. Uh, also to the Italians, we'll probably break away with uh, the, the Lega people before, which are already doubting whether this is a good thing. Their base in northern Italy is, is shaking. So uh, there's a little bit of time left, but the big argument will be uh, the same as we saw in Brexit, the EU is bad for you. This is, this is something everyone can uh, rally behind. And look at Sh uh, Bannon. I mean, he was traveling around with that message. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, on, on Bannon, that he's in Brussels, he's campaigning, he's going to be next week there, and he, he's, he's trying to do that. But I, I'm, I agree with Stefan very much that this, the message has to be very simple, as simple as a populist message of the EU is bad for you. It can be a simple message of how good the EU is for you. So, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a, one is fear, and the, the message of fear is, is, is hard to defeat, but also the message of hope is a very strong one, so we have to work with that. If I can pose one last question to the panel, um, very briefly, also to connect this panel with the previous one. The last question from the previous panel was, give us your single best idea for <laughs> improving yeah. the EU. Um, Eleni, you mentioned you've become very cynical working in Brussels about EU politics. I think it's fair to say that um, consumers of news have become very uh, cynical about journalism, whether that's fair or unfair. And coverage, for example, that's going on right now in this country about the caravan um, is being criticized for amplifying a message that is not based on anything that's factual. So my question to each of you, <laughs> very briefly, is if there's one thing that you feel your newsroom could do better or do differently that would help shift the debate onto a more factual basis or restore trust in, in the crucial function that journalists have, in, in civic discourse and in democracy, what would it be? In, in my newsroom, the basic problem is that we are very Greek-centered. We only care about Greece. All news have to do with Greece. Whatever story you, you pitch that is not Greek-centered, they don't like it. That's, that's a very big <laughs> problem. So, I mean, we are so micro. Uh, I'm, I'm covering, I'm in Brussels. I'm the only person covering from my news group covering what's going on, and I have to cover everything that has to do with Greece in, in such a granular way. I don't give the big picture, and I try to do that, but I have to do it maybe harder. Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep it simple, but, um, and keep it positive, quite honestly. I think people are sick and tired, not about the media, but because they are over-demanded with the amount they have to consume and have to absorb. And it's not our fault. This is here Apple's fault or whoever uh, <laughs> came up with these devices that we are sort of in a 24-7 news environment. Uh, so we probably have to tone down in, 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 in shrillness. We don't need to exaggerate where there is no need to exaggerate. Rather sort of keep it in perspective. And I, I think it's weird if I say that as a journalist, usually we have to find the, the, the man who bites the dog or sort of find the shrillness in the stories because this is what sells. But I think I'm, I'm, I consider myself more and more sort of a, 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 sort of a, um, a, a, a therapist for, <laughs> for a hyper-nervous <laughs> nation full of angst and doom and try to calm it down and say, listen, we're going to manage. It's okay. And uh, drinks for everyone. <laughs> um, Last word for Stephen. I would say our biggest task is empathy. Our job is to listen and to reflect to our readers what people actually are feeling and thinking, even if we disagree ourselves with what they're feeling and thinking. I think we haven't done a, a good enough job of that. We need to figure out why people vote for Kaczynski, why they vote for Orban, why they feel the way they feel, and do it in a way that brings home those understandings to others. Let's, what did they want for Let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Please thank our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.